Well, good morning. good morning. I noticed you uh, moved your services up to 10 to try to get me done quicker. <laughs> and now you're quitting singing four songs short just to try to. That's, uh, I'm, I'm a, I might get a complex about this. Um, the, um, and, I will t and it was not by intent, but um, I kind of had an idea of what. I just had a notion that this was the scripture God wanted, but he just wasn't bringing it all together. So it's, um, uh, we, we're, this one's at least fresh. I don't know how developed it is, but it's fresh because it, it's still uh, still kind of in the, uh, the mold. But it is good to be back with you. Um, kind of occasionally kept in touch through Todd and uh, would check in every so often online and see what was going on out here. Um, since we've been uh, with you last, uh, the pastor at Wingo retired, so I'm uh, full-time interim there I just told him I had to have one Sunday a month off where I could go do stuff if I needed to uh, for churches and so uh, there's somebody preaching for me there this morning um, do remember uh, our church this morning and in and, and our it's our closest family friend um, that he passed away last night the, his family and our family just grew up together I did all three of his son's weddings I did uh, two of their parents funerals and Billy Brown was his name. If any of you know any uh, businessmen in Mayfield at all, he owned Gibson's Discount Pharmacy and just a fine. He was a deacon in the church. And the only reason why he wasn't an elder was because he just said, I'm just not qualified. I just, he was always such an humble man and uh, always believed in serving the Lord and serving his church. But uh, uh, he passed away last night. And so uh, we'll have, uh, there'll be a, a hole in our church, certainly. He's one of the most generous really lived the scripture in terms of let not your left hand know what your right hand doing uh, does because he he was one of the most giving people but wanted absolutely no credit for it whatsoever and wanted to make sure that uh, things didn't uh, people most of the time didn't uh, he would shy against it if, if people knew he did it uh, because he didn't want people to know that he was doing the, uh, the things that he was doing but such a uh, kind godly man but uh, we will certainly miss his uh, son is owns Brown Funeral Home, that's the family. Uh, his dad built Brown Funeral Home in, in Wingo and Clinton and now Mayfield, and his son runs it now. And so it's a prominent family in the community, and uh, we'll, we'll certainly miss them. But we're glad you're here. I'm glad you're uh, uh, still uh, serving the Lord and still uh, seeking to be a part of his kingdom. Have any of you gotten your shot or getting your shot? Or you there? Uh, um, Todd got his? No, you haven't? I thought it was on. Is it not? I thought I held it. Oop, held the wrong button, that's why. How's that? <laughs> we're glad you're here. All right, we're going to come from Romans chapter 4 this morning. We're... Uh, uh, I'm going to attempt to uh, tie together. I understand we are ordaining one and installing two. Is that correct? Um, we um, uh, and I will. Um, I will say this, and probably it would have fit in better. But I, I made sure Todd said, "Well, it goes too late to be studying." I was double checking to make sure that when we get to that part of the uh, service that I've got the right questions that I'm supposed to ask because I have been, and I may have told you all this story here before. Uh, that I have uh, at times taken people into the congregation and turned to the wrong set of questions and asked them the elder questions. Uh, and so, uh, but it's, it's, I've also said that's not necessarily bad theology. If we all just enter the church as if we're going to be an elder, uh, we might get an idea of what God really needs of us. Uh, God needs us all to be, and, and jokingly, but not jokingly, we're about to get everybody ordained here as an elder. Uh, so... <laughs> Uh, pretty soon, everybody's going to be one, uh, so we're all going to have the same, uh, uh, the same call and the same duty, and uh, uh, God just, and that may be what he needs for us to all just realize that uh, it, it falls equally on all of our shoulders, and uh, uh, God has a, a, a work that he needs to do through us. Romans chapter 4, verse 13, and we will read through verse 25, and if you can and are able, would you please stand in reverence to God's word? Clearly, God promise, God's promise to the whole earth 
to Abra- to give the whole earth to Abraham and his descendants was based not on his obedience to God's law, but on a right relationship with God that comes by faith. <clears throat> if God's promise is only for those who obey the law, then faith is not necessary and the promise is pointless. For the law always brings punishment on those who try to obey it. The only way to avoid breaking the law is to have no law to break. So the promise is received by faith. <clears throat> it is given as a free gift And we are all certain to receive it whether or not we live according to the law of Moses. If we have faith like Abraham. For Abraham is the father of all who believe. That is what the scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping believing he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about a hundred years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead. And so was Sarah's womb. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger. And in this, he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he counted, uh, whatever he promises. <coughs> Excuse me. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. And when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit too, assuring us that God will also count us as righteous if we believe in him. The one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He handed over to die. He was handed over to die because of our sins, and he was raised to life to make us right with God. You may be seated. And let's go to God in prayer again, please. Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to to be into your house and to uh, to be able to worship you. Uh, we know that we are in uh, times as we've. <clears throat> as we've never seen before, and uh, Father, things may get worse, and it seems that uh, more and more they're going to come after your people. Uh, What we have discovered many times is that, uh, certainly if you read the Old Testament at all, uh, that those were the times that you used to bring your people back, that those were times that you used to, uh, to make us realize what our faith requires of us, to make us realize uh, how worldly, Uh, We have become many times and how uh, influenced by uh, the things around us, how how, how we have just uh, uh, fallen into line rather than uh, to have been the salt and the light that you've called us to be. Lord, we we pray that uh, you would place that that burden upon your churches everywhere. Uh, Lord, as, as Tim prayed, there are those who are rightfully so. Uh, who are uh, sheltering in place, if you will. There are those who are being cautious and those who are, um, uh, those who are uh, acting uh, in accordance to what we would expect them to do. But Lord, there are many who have just used this opportunity to, uh, in, in the name of caution, have just become um, uh, in many ways faithless, Father. In many ways, uh, just we, we've settled into what's convenient and what's easy and we've uh, we, we've called it uh, uh, caution. Father, we just pray that we would, uh, for those of us who, uh, <laughs> those of us who have no excuse, those of us who, uh, who have the health and who have the ability and who have uh, the, uh, the means, Lord, we need to be back in the work of the kingdom. And we just pray that you would uh, place that burden on our heart and that you would uh, not let us rest easy. Uh, because there is a world that is rapidly uh, not falling away. They're running away from you right now, Father. And Lord, this world needs your gospel. This world needs uh, needs your word. So make us faithful to that. Make us uh, convinced of that. And Lord, make us fueled by that. Lord, we pray for uh, those who are accepting the, the call to leadership today. Lord, help us to, as we, we said it jokingly, but Father, we realize it's the truth now. Father. We're all called to the same thing. Uh, we may be filling uh, different offices at different times, but Lord, we're all called uh, to be responsive to your spirit and to be 
uh, ever attentive to what you desire for us to, uh, to, to be and do. And Lord, we just pray that you would uh, give that uh, fresh call, that fresh um, uh, passion, if you will, uh, to, uh, to, to be your church again right here. As Todd always says, right here along the side of Old Benton Road. I heard it prayed here first, and Lord, I think it's always appropriate to pray it wherever we are, but certainly when we're here. Lord, we just need you to be big, and we need you to be big in us and through us so that you can do your work. Speak to us through your word this morning, Father. For it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. <laughs> I thought I might have heard somebody sneak up. Thank you, whoever. There, I appreciate it. Just here to be a blessing, right? <laughs> they, uh, and chances are still good. You can beat the Baptist to the restaurant. Right? With, with me starting at 10 o'clock, you can still... By the way, I don't even have written down who my, who my older people are. So when that, you might give me some names when that, uh, when that time comes. I, uh, I might just ordain everybody. Just bring everybody up and throw some water on you. I've always said when we did infant baptism, we were throwing the water on the wrong people. Uh, so we ought to just be throwing the water on the con congregation because that's what, that's what we're saying. So we might just do that. We might just throw water everywhere and, and, and ordain everybody this morning. The, if, if I've got a, a, a title, I guess, I've got it, at home, I have a couple that always, if, I'm, if I go about three minutes into my sermon and haven't given them a title to give to their notes, they, I'll start getting the look and I'll just, I'm, they'll hold their pad up and they, they tell me that they want the title. So if you want a title, I guess, is As the Story is Told. Uh, as the Story is Told. Because have you ever noticed that uh, stories get sanctified a little bit over time? Uh, they, they grow. Uh, sometimes they... Uh, a lot of times they uh, <clears throat> omit some of the uh, some of the facts. They they and they become more sanctified, especially at at funerals. You notice that an awful lot. Rarely ever do you hear uh, any of the bad stuff about anybody. You don't hear. Uh, you, what you hear is everybody telling all the good stories and everybody uh, acting like they were uh, they loved them every minute of their life, you know. And we realize that's not the way it, it really is a lot of the times. There's uh, stories change. I, uh, and I still won't ever forget that uh, a friend of mine from college he posted on Facebook once on Mother's Day and told the story about his. How, and I probably tell, have told this story here <laughs> other times. But he told about how loving his mother was and what a great mother she was and what all this, uh, how, how she was so influential in his life. And I thought, yeah, that's right, because you're one of the most obnoxious people I've ever met. And so was she, because I met her. Um, the first time I ever met her, <clears throat> we were on a, a trip through, um, we, we went up to Cincinnati and uh, we were Bethel at that time. You were on a budget, so when you went on a trip like that, there was several players from Cincinnati, so we just all divided up and stayed at the players' houses. Um, and I'd, I drew the lucky one to get to stay at the coach's house. Uh, he and his brother were uh, both on the team, and, or his brother was on the team and he was the coach, and I stayed at their house. And when I, and it wasn't a well-kept house by any shape, form, or fashion, and of course, I was, and it was, a, it was, they were smokers, and that made it even worse for me and my, my allergies, but, um, it, it, you know, and I was used to, uh, my mom kept a, a very neat house, and it wasn't just when the, when the, uh, uh, when family, when, or uh, when guests were coming over. My mom kept a neat house. Uh, well, there wasn't any uh, primping up for us, for there, certainly. Uh, there was spots that you could find to sit, and most, you know, it was the the tables were stacked with papers, and the the ashtrays were around, and the kitchen table was just full of open cereal boxes, and that, you know, you kind of you've seen those kind of places. And the the mom, of course, she was a working mom, uh, which was uh, not as common then as it was as it is now, but. Uh, there was, uh, she, she came in after everybody else, but uh, we ordered out. There wasn't cooking done in the house. You know, we ordered out and we ate. Uh, and then when we came in, but nobody told me that there was a chair that belonged to his mom. And when she came in, I was sitting in her chair. Nobody told me that. Nobody told me that when mom comes in, you're supposed to get out of her way. 
uh, because mom was going to come in. Mom was going to plant herself in that chair, and mom wasn't going to move till bedtime. Uh, but my first, the very first time, the very first line I'd ever heard his mom say was, Mike, I don't know who your friend is, but has anybody told him that his is in my chair? Uh, well, nobody had, but quickly his moved out of that chair, I can tell you. Uh, and I got out of her way. And the rest of the night, the whole earth just orbited around mom. I can just tell you, you know, she didn't, she didn't, she didn't help anybody else. That her husband did to clean it up. Her husband did the uh, brought his the brought her her food to her and and uh, presented her with the remote and everything else. Just kind of um, went around her, you know. And that's kind of what I, and that's basically all I knew. She showed up for one or two games along the way, and she was as obnoxious at the games as she was, you know. But he just tells the story of what a loving mother he had. And I said, uh, you poor child, that that's what you thought a loving mother looked like. You know, I'd like to introduce you to my mom to show you what a, a loving mother really looked like. You know, but the stories get cleaned up over time. Stories get sanctified. You know that whole story that we got lots of baseball fans here, so I know you've all heard the story of Babe Ruth calling his shot in the 1932 World Series. Supposedly, he stepped into uh, the, the plate and... Strike one came, and um, were you watching that series? So you could you tell us? I, you weren't watching it live. I, uh, I don't. I didn't know whether Todd could tell us the, whether it actually happened or not. Because I'm Timmy could tell. Um, but supposedly strike one came through, uh, and the Cub fans are uh, talking smack. And supposedly strike two came through, and they're now the dugouts involved, and they're call, talking smack and all this other stuff. And supposedly Babe Ruth stepped out and pointed to right or to center field and then hit the shot. Now, there's even some amateur photos that really don't give credence to that story. There, now, he pointed, but there, uh, there's more evidence. And originally even, Babe Ruth told the story that he was just talking to the Cubs' dugout. That it was just strike one. That it was just strike two. Supposedly, maybe even he was just talking to the pitcher because the pitcher was getting kind of cocky during that time. But what he discovered was Babe Ruth was an ultimate uh, man that knew how to use the media before the media became the weapon even that it was today. That he understood that the, the story that was written, because there was only one reporter that day, there was only one reporter that wrote a story and his headline read, Babe Ruth calls his shot and then hits it into center field. And so what does history record? That Babe Ruth called his shot and hit it into center field. And because there was the story of Babe Ruth telling the boy in the hospital that he was going to hit him a home run, and that he did that later on, it just kind of grew in that uh, lore of, of, of Babe Ruth, the, the, the myth more than the historical figure. Because there was lots of things about Babe Ruth we don't need to talk about. Uh, if you're a baseball player, you don't need to talk about his uh, poor training habits. You don't need to talk about his, uh, his uh, fact that he would many times pray probably half inebriated uh, during that time. He wasn't a saint, but history can kind of turn him into that. Well, you see that, and, and I, I use that as my open illustration because if you hear Paul's telling of the story of Abraham... You get kind of this sanctified story of Abraham that leaves out all the bad stuff. And I tell you that because that's a good thing. Because history will more often than not remember us by our final moments rather than our failure moments. History will more often than not remember us by how we finished, not how we failed. And that's a good, because, and that's the way God writes history in the first place. And that's what God wants. And that's 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 a, a Christian view of how you look at things. Because if we view Paul through the majority of Paul's life, what do we see? Paul was one who was not. Uh, he was one who was. He was a Pharisee. He was one of the bad guys up for for most of his life. Paul was one uh, that persecuted the church, and you don't hear a whole lot. As a matter of fact. Paul calls our attention to that more so so that we don't get the idea that he was this super saint that never messed up. 
Paul had a record that was not necessarily uh, one to be a leader in the church. Paul had one who was trying to destroy the church. But because God came into his life, because we know that Acts chapter 9 happened, I think it's 9, isn't it? When the, it's 8 or 9, when Paul is uh, knocked down on the, uh, the road to Damascus, that God changed who Paul was, and the end of his story was very different than the beginning of his story. The end of his story was even very different than perhaps the most um, uh, impactful part. You know, because he was, Paul really was the one that stood at the balance. Paul could have destroyed the church, but thankfully when God's grace changed him, he became a part of the church that could not be destroyed. You know, isn't it amazing that Paul stood on that moment, but what happened? And so he tells that story, and he tells of Abraham. And he says, Abraham, who didn't lose faith. Well, Paul didn't do what my grandmother always did when, she, when my grandmother taught the teenagers, and even into her 80s, she taught the teenagers. And I told somebody that, you know, that, and, I laugh, and it's the truth, though. It's not, it's not, I'm not making up something that wasn't there. When my grandma, when we went through the faith chapter, it literally took three to four years of my teenage years to get through the faith chapter. Because my grandmother never referenced a story in the New Testament that you didn't have to go back to the Old Testament and read the story that it was referencing. So when he talked about Enoch, you had to go read about Enoch. When he talked about Abraham, you had to go read about Abraham. When he talked about Isaac, you had to read the story about Isaac being offered up. I mean, literally, so it took us years to get through because you had to understand the story behind it uh, when we did that. And so when he says that Abraham remained faithful, he's revising history a little bit. He's leaving out some parts. But I tell you that because we can have that to be hopeful today. Paul tells a sanctified story because the story that God will tell of Woodlawn Church hangs in the balance. You know, we know, you know, I was a, a young children during that time. But we know there was the story of Woodlawn as one of the biggest growingest church in, churches in the denomination. But we've also said in many session meetings in the last few years where we've heard and, and mourned the stories of difficulty, let's just say, and frustration and futility. And well, what are we going to do? Well, let's... See what the story that we tell is. And, and let me encourage you because this is what I want to challenge those who are accepting the call to leadership today and who are accepting that role that God is putting you into in the life of this congregation. That We don't have to be defined by what we are right now. And that ultimately, even there's going to come a time if God tarries long enough that none of us are going to be here. And whether wood, if Woodlawn is here, it's going to mean that God has told a different story through us than he's telling right now. That God is going to do something different. And that final story that he tells us may be very different than the story that we talk of right now. Look at verse 17. It says, this is what scriptures mean when God told Abraham, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. Paul was able to tell a sanctified story, first of all, because we know that ultimately Abraham was more responsive to the call than he was reactionary to the crowd. Ultimately, Abraham was more responsive to God's call than he was reactionary to the crowd. Now, why am I saying that? Because God's call came when Abraham was 75 years old. We don't even hear of, and you're, what are you, 73? <laughs> they're, uh, they're, so you're getting close. They're, they're, God's call did not even, God's, God's work in Abraham's life did not even begin so far as Scripture records until Abraham was an old man. 
And then, even after the call came, there was a period of 15 years where virtually nothing happened. (laughs) Virtually nothing occurred during that time other than God had given Abraham a call that said, I will make of you a great nation. And then he said, and I'm going to give you a land that I'm going to show you. And he said, where? And he said, just go. (laughs) I'll show you as we go. And so Abraham's journey began with a call. He be, it began with, all I know is God said go. All I know is God said let's move. All I know is, is God said he's going to do. And he just keeps saying, I'm going to show you. And, he, and, and his entire, you know, for 15 years it was, all he had was a call. But while he's going, we know that there were many times during the way that Abraham failed. There were times when Abraham uh, wavered on that call that God had given him. Because we know when he came into that, remember when that uh, crowd of folks came, what did Abraham do with Sarah, his wife? Abraham called Sarah his sister. Why? Because he was afraid that the crowd was going to kill him if he really told them what was going on, if he really says, you know, I'm, I, God's going to make me a great nation, and that's my wife, and I know you don't recognize it, but she's a hottie, and and God's going to God's going to bring those of you who are NASCAR fans will know that reference, you know, there uh, that stirred up quite the stir a few years ago. But God called him and said, I am going to make a nation out of you and her, and he said, I know we don't look like it, but we're fruitful. I know it don't look like it, but we're fitting to have grandchildren. So you just need to just leave us alone. What did Abraham do? During that time when Abraham said, okay, God gave me this call, but this is really kind of absurd. And all I know is the only way to get out of here is, is for me to make up a different story than the real thing. You know, and I think we are rapidly, rapidly, running into a part where our church is, our, and not just Woodlawn, but our churches as a whole. We are entering a time when our churches have to decide, are we going to stand on the call that God has given us? Are we going to stand on the word that God has given us to stand on? Or are we going to settle into what the crowd around us says we should be? Because I can tell you, there will never be a, more, a time anymore uh, in, in the life of our country than we are going to be more anti-culture or, or, or counter-cultural than we are going to be in this period right now. There is open season on the church. And God has got to call us. And we've got to, you know, when we, uh, when we make decisions and when we, when we stand, that we've got to know that God has called us to extend his light and his light of his word. And we believe that God's word is relevant today as it was 50 years ago, that God's word has not changed, that God's always been faithful, that God will always reveal himself through his word. And, and that's going to be very unpopular. You know, and here, and I don't want this to sound uh, unsympathetic at all. I've lost family and I've lost friends to this COVID virus, but here's what we need to understand in the middle of all this. If we, and, and we all know, we'll never get good stats out of this stuff because uh, it's become so politicized. We know that there are many who have died because of COVID. There are many that have died that would have died that just happened to have COVID uh, during that time that they've thrown into that numbers. But if you count every one of them, 500,000 people, you need to know that's still only half as many people as have been killed through abortion this year in the United States of America. And if you read back through Deuteronomy, he said, stop murdering the innocent. And we can call it whatever you want. You can brand it under whatever choice you want to. It's We are in a culture that has decided certain things are okay and certain things are not. And there are things that God's word says clearly we've got to stand on as his people. And it doesn't matter whether it offends those around us or not. I had, God's going to call us sometimes to step out and to be different. And we're going to have to be. You know, it's, it, it's uh, <laughs> I've got to, I'll, I'll tell you this story because it's, uh, I think it's uh, uh, relevant for where, for where we are. But I've got to, uh, of course, this whole virtual learning mess 
Uh, it's killing kids, and, and most of the ones who chose virtual are there because they didn't want to be in school in the first place, uh, not because they're scared. You know, most of them that are virtual are still going to their jobs and everything else, and especially at the high school level. And so that we've got these. But we, I had one that came back at Christmas that had did, literally not turned in one assignment the entire first semester. And he's been back since Christmas, and really, and I don't know that he's turned in one assignment since Christmas either. Uh, he's just been in person, not uh, not uh, turning anything in. But he's, and I know there's some emotional issues that go on, and but especially the first few weeks, what I noticed was, is, and he gets there early out of so many rides of bus. He would come in, he would sit down, and really doesn't talk to anybody. And along about the time class was going to start, he would work himself into a crying issue so that he would have to leave class. And this happened three or four times the first couple of weeks. And, of course, uh, nobody's ever probably accused me of being overly sympathetic. Um, my, my compassion gene is not, you know, I'm more, get over it, you know, toughen up, rub some dirt in it, you know, <laughs> you'll be all right. That kind of, that's why I'm not a real good pastoral counselor. Uh, <laughs> you know, I just... I listen a while and I say, okay, grow up, you know, get over it. Um, that's that's kind of where I'm, I fall too many times. It's just not my gift. But this one, and I will tell you this, not about the fourth or fifth time he uh, he's did that, you know, I'm trying to get on with class. And he had literally worked himself up and I could see it starting. You know, he starts to shake and the legs start to shake and then he starts to... You know, and he'll do the hands and everything else. And when I went over there, and he pulled out a bunch of his hair and was on his desk. And so I was trying not to call attention to it. And I was walking around the class, and I came by him, and I said, do you need, do you need to go to the office? And he said, yeah, probably. And I said, okay, pick up your hair and go to the office. Uh, so uh, that's kind of worth So that's about the depth of my compassion there. But there is another young man in our, in, that's, and it's, it's, again, because this is a kid that nobody else really talks to, but there's a young, and he's a, a special needs child in my class, but what I've noticed is, is the last three or four times that he's hit those, this kid gets up, and he goes over, and he puts his arm around him, and he's, oh, it's going to be all right, you know, and you can see him, he can, he'll just pat on, you know, and he'll love, you know, and he'll try to encourage him, and he'll get, through, you know, and he hadn't had to leave. You know, and, I, and then God starts uh, working on me a little bit. And I, you know, you might just think, learn a little bit about compassion, maybe. <laughs> you might just learn a little bit about stepping against the crowd. You know, because that's what we're going we're gonna to be called to do. We're going to be called to stand when others don't. God, he, and that's what Abraham was. He had a call. And at 75, God said, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. And he didn't give him a whole lot of details. He just said, this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> and that guided who he was more than the crowd around him, even though he failed. Verse 18, even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about 100 years of age he figured his body was as good as dead, and so was Sarah's womb. Now, if you've studied your Old Testament at all, you know how sanctified that paragraph is. Because what happened? The reality was Abraham did lose faith in the middle of it. Sarah lost faith. Sarah first laughed, and then he kind of called her on the carpet. Oh, I didn't laugh. Yes, you did. Now you lied. Uh, <laughs> you laughed. Now you lied. You got two L's and two sins. Okay, Sarah, you know, let's, let's clean this up. But then what happened? Sarah then actually said, okay, look, this ain't happening. So maybe you need to have a child with Hagar. And that's what he did. So they both lost faith in the middle of it. But what did Paul say? Oh, his faith didn't weaken. It actually grew. Well, why did, we, why did Paul say such a thing? Was he trying to deceive us? No. Because we know the end story tells us this, that he was more convinced of God's faithfulness than he was controlled by his own futility or his own fears. Abraham was more convinced of God's faithfulness than he was controlled by his own futility. 
ultimately, Abraham, Abraham still kept trying with Sarah. <laughs> Abraham still kept going, and Abraham still, because it didn't just, there, there's only, there was only one immaculate conception. There was only one where God came down and placed the seed. Oh, Abraham had to place the seed. And so he kept trying. He kept, and he saw God's faithfulness uh, uh, carried out in his life because ultimately he realized, I believe God is faithful more than I believe I am a mess, I, more than I'm messing up. He, and he realized pretty soon because what happened? After he had the child with Hagar, then Sarah became, um, uh, I do have Hagar right. In my, uh, that's right, right? Okay. Just all of a sudden it didn't sound right. There, uh, all of a sudden, uh, Sarah got jealous and then now, now I've got what? <laughs> Now I got an unhappy wife and a and a concubine that, that's that's unhappy and she's scared of Sarah and he has to go, he has to send Sarah. Away. You know he had all kinds of problems. Abraham made a mess of this thing because he lost faith, but because he decided that God was faithful and somehow he said and God kept saying, "I told you I was going to have a child with you and Sarah." He trusted God and returned to that. And when he became over, when, when ultimately he was more uh, controlled by that faithfulness, God used him and Isaac was born. You know, I think we, we can see it because it is so easy when we get in the situation like we are now. To say, well, we've tried this, but. Well, these other churches have this. Well, this is, well, we can't get, well, we can well, we, but does it, ultimately what does it matter? God can so we got to get past all the we can'ts to the God can part. And to understand what God can do and what God will do when we just allow God to do through us. God does, but God does through us. And God will if we are faithful to Him. You know, and when we don't, when we're controlled by our fears, the, other time I said, the first time I said controlled by our fears, when I wrote, I've got fears or futility. So you can look at this because there were many times that Abraham was fearful along that way. There were many times that we become fearful. There's many times that we can just seem hopeless in the middle of this thing. But it says he hoped when there was no reason for hope. He believed when there was no reason to believe. He was calm. He was, he was uh, overwhelmed by the fact that God's in control of this thing even when there was no evidence that he was. They, um, you know, I had a, a great experience, um, I don't remember when it was, several years back, but it, I was principal, at, uh, uh, well, I, 2013, I can tell you what it was, now I know the timeline, when I put the pieces together. I got to, anybody ever heard of the Army Golden Knights? They're that group that jumps from planes on the universe, and they, they'll, they'll fly into football stadiums, and they'll, they, they're, uh, they, they they're basically a, a, a showpiece for the uh, for the United States Army. And through the course of trying to get the junior ROTC program at Graves County High School, I got I got to go to the Army All American Bowl and got to meet uh, different people. Sit you know sit there with two star generals and three star generals and met uh, you know and I met this guy on the plane on the way back home and I'm really trying to shorten the story. Uh, but he, uh, we, we had the same plane all the way back, and uh, so we you know, tell that we had come from the same place. And on the, the third flight, he said, well, he said, what, I'm assuming you were here with the Army, uh, All-American Bowl, and I told him yes. And he said, well, I appreciate your sir, what you do for the Army and everything else. And I, I'm a nobody. You know, I'm a high school principal that's trying to get a JROTC program. You know, I'm, I'm a nobody, but I, you know, I, I appreciate your service. Well, we got to talking, and our luggage was delayed. After we got off at Nashville, our luggage was delayed, so we ended up by each other again. And he asked me, he said, did you get to jump with the Army Golden Knights while you were, because that was one of the options we had. You had the option of shooting with the marksmanship team or jumping with the Army Golden Knights. Well, there were only so many places with the Knights, and even though I signed up for it, I didn't get it. I just shot with the Army Marksmanship Team. And um, so I didn't, uh, I didn't get chosen while I was in San Antonio. But he's, Colonel Rado was the guy's name who was over the Army Golden Knights. Colonel Rado. Okay? So this guy, I'm talking to him in the airport, still hasn't got his name. He says, well, you, you didn't get to jump? And I said, no, I didn't. He said, well, you know, Colonel Rado was my assistant when I retired, and um, 
That's what the Army Golden Knights is for. They're, to, uh, they're a public relations branch, and, I'm, and immediately I'm thinking, a full bird colonel is your assistant. I'm talking to somebody here. This ain't no, this ain't no average dude here. You know, I'm talking to somebody with some clout here. Well, turn to find he hands me his card, and he's a retired three-star general. Uh, he lives in Gallatin, Tennessee. His wife's from Martin, Tennessee. And he was really the most influential person in us getting the JROTC. But he got me connected with Colonel Rado, and I got to jump from the plane. I went to Fort Knox. They were doing an anniversary thing and went to Fort Knox. And when we started, when they were giving us the introduction, so you're, you're jumping from 13,500 feet is what you're doing. It's a tandem jump. But 13,500 feet, you're going to leave a perfectly good airplane and, and jump is, what, is this, the way this thing's going to go. And there was three groups going up at a time. And when... The one that uh, the, these, all these uh, guys introduced themselves, and this one guy said, he said, well, I've done over 4,000 jumps, and he said, and I've actually jumped with uh, presidents. And all of a sudden, I'm remembering history. I don't know if you remember, but George H.W. Bush, when he was 80 years old, jumped from a plane. And I'm thinking, I know who you are, and I know who you jumped with. And so it, and it turns out it was, because when we got on the plane... And then when, as soon as they told, they announced who we were stu- who we were paired with, they told me him. I mean, immediately, any fears that I had left. I mean, and I'm not acting big. It just because on the video up there, they they're taking video and they're saying all this stuff. They try to get people nervous, and they they because uh, you have you have a jumper and you have a camera guy that jumps right beside you that's flying all around you and all this other stuff. And. <laughs> They kept saying, did you take this, you know, did you take your medicine, did you take, you know, and all this, you know, to, to, and, I, and at one point they say, you're really not nervous. And I said, you know, I'm not. I said, this is going to be, and I, they said, why not? And I said, if you're good enough for H.W. Bush, you're good enough for me, I'm just telling you. <laughs> I don't have to worry about this thing. I believe I can trust myself. If they'll trust the former president of the United States to you, I'm going to trust myself to you, and I'm going to enjoy the ride. You know, and when we ultimately decide that God is big enough in this thing, that God is, you know, it's not about my faith. That's the thing we need to understand about it. When he's talking about it, God, Abraham's faith, you understand that faith, and there's a whole lot more to this, and Tim could probably do a real good job of teaching it, but that faith is God's gift in the first place. God gives us that faith, and we get too concerned about, do I have enough faith, do I have enough faith, do I have enough faith? No, I don't. But what I know is, is he's faithful enough when I don't have enough. I don't have to worry about my lack of faith. What I need to be most focused on is his faithfulness. And if I know he is faithful above all else, and when I focus on his faithfulness, then I'm not so concerned about my futility. I'm not overwhelmed by the things that I can't do because I know he can do. What a great thing that is to know. In verse 20, Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. (laughs) Paul. Paul. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in this he brought glory to God. He was truly convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. And when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit too. Assuring us that God will also count us as righteous if we believe in him, the one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. Now, By the end of the story, what you find is is that Abraham's faith had grown. You find that when he took Isaac to the mountain, there there was some faith there. But you understood, he took a knife, he took wood, because he fully expected, and you're also living in a time where child sacrifice was very prevalent. Sacrifice to the god Moloch was very prevalent in Canaan during that time. And so for a god to be saying, sacrifice your son to me, was not impossible. And it wasn't out of the realm of what he'd understood. But what he knew was, remember what he said on the way up there? 
God, where's the sacrifice? God will provide. And do you think that he really thought going up there that God was going to provide him a ram? I don't think so. I just think that Abraham was more hopeful of resurrection than he was happily retired. I think he was more hopeful of resurrection because I believe he thought if God can bring a son out of a dead body and a dead womb, God can re bring my son back in some form or fashion after he tells me to give him to him. Because if he is the if he can resurrect a dead room, he can resurrect a dead body. And I believe he was more hopeful than he was fearful. Than he was broken. Than he was destroyed by what was in front of him. It's a possibility. God, could you possibly be asking me this? Oh, God could. But what he knows is, what he knew was, even before, even before Jesus was raised from the dead. Read that. He says, I believe God is even able to raise him. Now that's where faith grows. And that even if we sit here, I didn't even count, 20, 25, whatever, I don't know what, what we are today. Do we believe are we more hopeful in the resurrection that God can bring life from death? Are we more hopeful that God can bring renewed purpose and passion and kingdom work to the side of Old Benton Road than we are happily retired and riding it out? Wouldn't it have been easy for you? <laughs> Lord, I'm 75. And at 90, things still wasn't happening much. I believe he was 99, wasn't he? Paul, <laughs> you can tell Paul was a preacher. He rounded up to 100. <laughs> a good preacher will say there was 50 here today. <laughs> Paul uses those rounded numbers. You know, before long, if God tarries, something's going to get us all. That's right. Had been but two. Now, I'm okay if he goes ahead and comes back and splits them wide open. I'm, I'm just going to tell you, I'm, <laughs> I'm okay with it. If he wants to come on back, I'm okay with it. I'm ready. I'll take it. But you know, that's why, I don't know if you've driven from Mayfield to Paducah on Highway 45 and notice up on the right there's a big billboard and I was proud when our when the session at Wingo felt compelled to do it but all it is is the scripture out of of uh, 2 Timothy that says God has not given you a spirit of fear but of power and love and a sound mind and we don't have to live in fear because the worst that this world can do to us is take the breath from this body. But when the world does its worth, worst, he was handed over to die because of our sins and he was raised to life to make us right with God. When the worst that can happen here happens, we wake up in the presence of our resurrected Lord because we're hopeful. We don't have to be people that are pessimistic. We don't have to be people that are controlled by the news and controlled by all this stuff around us. We can be people of the resurrection that know. Two big things are happening in the real near future. Tomorrow, y'all have heard me talk, I'm sure, at some point, about John he was a youth in my uh, youth group at Shiloh when I was in Campbellsville. Spent 13 years in prison the first time, was out six, and now is 
spent almost four back in. He gets out tomorrow. Another one that you would know from camp has been in about four years. A different one. Cody. Cody gets out April 1st. Now, God's been doing some work on him while they're in there. But I'm so thankful because John, now I'm still not as excited about Cody getting out just yet because there's a lot of things that have to happen between now and then. His dad just got arrested a couple weeks ago. But while John was in prison, he met a guy named Bobby Holland. Bobby served 27 years, I think it was, for murder. But Bobby came to know the Lord while he was inside there. And Bobby works now as part of the Prisoners of Hope ministry. Bobby has some kind of business of his own, too. Because when I talked to him this week, I said, so are things still, you know, when John got out before, I had the office time, find him a place to live. I finally found a halfway house in Louisville. Then, you know, had to, couldn't, had trouble finding jobs and still never could get him a church to hook up with and, and just any kind of accountability. I just, you know, but in prison of all places. My text from Bobby on Tuesday, I said, are things still good for John on Monday? He says, we're picking him up. He's got a house waiting, and he's got a job waiting on Tuesday. And he said, he'll be attending church with me every Sunday morning. And in our prisoner support group and accountability, I think it is on Tuesday nights. Twenty-seven years of prison. Cody sent me a letter, and he went. He got in, in the process of all this. He got into some Aryan Nation stuff and all this other stuff. And, I'm, and, and then at the end, but he gave me this. I mean, it was eight pages front and back of this letter that he sent, and then began to talk about how that God had shown him what was wrong in his life. And I thought, no, that ain't the way I'd have gone about it. <laughs> by way of the Aryan nation is not the way I would have gone about this but God you're big and so what am I believing I'm believing we serve a God of resurrection and that John's life can be different in the next 37 than it was the previous 20 that Cody's life could be better in the next 26 than it was in the first 26. Because God rose from the dead. He's about raising us from the dead. And we're to be a part of his work of resurrection. What's our hymn of invitation this morning? 430. We'll sing our closing hymn and in a minute we'll Bring our elders up, but we'll give you an opportunity, anybody who would like to uh, utilize the altar this morning in prayer, we certainly invite you to do so. I'm still Jesus, all of my trials, I cannot bear these burdens alone. My distress, he kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for his own. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help. Jesus alone. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. He is a kind, compassionate friend. If I ask him, he will deliver. Make up my troubles quickly and end. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must 
tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. 